Hi, it's Katrina. Hidden Alien City A video recently released by the U.S. Navy appears to show an unidentified flying object diving into the ocean off the coast of San Diego, California. Officials have confirmed the footage as authentic. These videos can be interpreted many ways since we don't have a lot of information. But this sighting has led some to believe there may be an underwater alien base nearby. The footage shows a spherical object flying above the water before stopping and slowly disappearing beneath the waves. The footage was recorded off a monitor inside the USS Omaha's Combat Information Center, and a few military members can be heard remarking on the object in the video, talking about it. There was no wreckage or evidence of any kind once it splashed through the surface of the water. Now, according to alien hunters from UFO Sightings Daily, they have discovered an alien base underwater near Mexico, estimated to be about 76 miles long. Apparently, this could be the reason why so many UFOs are sighted over the country. Perhaps it's because they have a base just 45 miles from the coast. The UFO search team was looking at Google Earth when they spotted a series of straight lines and lumps underwater that they believe are 100% made by an intelligent being other than humans. There also appears to be a gaping hole of complete blackness that could be the entrance to the base. It almost looks like the yawning door of some secret mountain facility, only it's underwater. As of now, nobody has actually gone down to explore what this structure might be. Since the release of documents by the U.S. government regarding what they call UAP, or Unidentified Aerial Phenomena, many are saying the structures should be explored using remotely controlled underwater drones. But it hasn't happened yet. So far, explanations of the UAP sightings vary from drones to weather balloons or new technology from China or Russia. In any case, the government is taking a more open approach to these sightings to raise awareness about possible security threats. As for what this structure might be under the ocean, we probably won't know for many years, if ever. Glowing Ocean Tubes Scientists are always amazed when they encounter this giant glowing tube in the ocean. It's actually a living creature, and perhaps one of the strangest creatures around. It's also one of the biggest, measuring up to 60 feet long. It looks like some sort of floating ghost or a spectral entity, but in reality, it's known as a pyrosome. It has no teeth, no eyes, no fins, it has nothing that makes it look like an actual animal. Instead, it's literally just a tube of glowing light, cylindrical and iridescent. How does it breathe or move or even exist? The enormous pyrosome is actually formed by thousands or millions of tiny creatures together in a colony. Also referred to as colonial tunicates, they are shaped like a tunnel except one side is closed off. They may look enormous and scary, but they are no threat to humans. However, biologists warn you should never try to swim inside one. Kay Gallet Holmes of Cicero Marine Research in Australia reports finding a six and a half foot long pyrosome with a dead penguin trapped inside. The penguin apparently suffocated inside the pyrosome, unable to escape. Pyrosomes are so rare that marine researcher Rebecca Helm referred to them once as the unicorns of the sea, completely improbable and utterly mysterious. They are similar to coral reefs in that many polyps come together and combine exoskeletons into one giant mass. The pyrosome is made up of many tiny creatures called zooids. They link together, joining their tissue and constantly filter the water to eat plankton, jetting out the water as they go to propel themselves. They eventually form these giant tubes floating listlessly through the ocean. To add to their mystery is the fact they are also bioluminescent, and when one zooid decides to light up, so do the ones around it. Light from one colony will cause another colony to light up, as if they were communicating with each other. Submerged French Weapons A collection of terrifying weapons and other maritime equipment has recently been salvaged from a creepy shipwreck off the coast of Florida. But this wasn't just one shipwreck, it was actually three vessels that sank sometime around the 16th century and created a giant field of debris underwater filled with strange artifacts. The weapons were discovered by Global Marine Exploration Inc., an underwater archaeology company. The artifacts probably came from a group of Protestants fleeing religious persecution in France, though the vessels themselves may not have been of French origin. Some of the best artifacts discovered from the wreckage include ornate bronze cannons, heaps of munition, a whole pile of anchors, and one grinding wheel. Archaeologists also uncovered a French coat of arms from the early colonial period. Workers were able to date the shipwrecks thanks to a marking on the side of one of the cannons. 
The marking was from the reign of King Henry II of France back in 1548. Archaeologists have speculated that these ships were actually from either England or Spain, and that their crews had taken cargo from Florida originally brought by French settlers, the ones who were escaping persecution. Many French people were fleeing France at the time because of escalations in the hostility between the Catholic Church and the Protestants. This was actually the beginning of the French Wars of Religion, which devastated France for 35 years. The Sunken Leg A teenager named Sebastian and his father were looking for treasure in the Gulf of Mexico. They strapped on their diving equipment and dove into the murky depths. And that was when they discovered something altogether creepy. They found what at first seemed to be a person's forgotten leg. Sebastian was the one to spot it first. He saw a leather strap waving in the water and something stuck in the sand. It took him about 10 minutes to pull out the strange object from the bottom, at which point he realized he was holding on to somebody's leg. Of course, it wasn't a real leg in the traditional sense, but somebody's prosthetic. Sebastian and his father hauled the leg onto their boat and decided what they were going to do with the weird artifact. In the end, they agreed to try and find the owner of the lost leg. It seemed like an impossible task, but they would try it anyway. Sebastian and his father made a Facebook page for the leg, uploaded a photo, where and when it was discovered, and then they sat back and waited. It didn't take long before Carter Hess, a veteran who had lost his leg and taken to surfing using his prosthetic, was alerted to the discovery. He reached out to Sebastian and his father, and just days later, the pair met at a beach restaurant and the leg was returned to its rightful owner. A spooky discovery turned into a heartwarming reunion. The Black Scabbard Fish The Black Scabbard Fish is one of the creepiest deepwater predators anywhere in the ocean. It lives at a depth of around 5,500 feet but has been known to migrate even deeper into the ocean veiled in utter darkness. This is not a fish you want to meet in the wild, as it has teeth like sharpened icicles and a voracious hunger that could lead to a person's arm being bitten clean off. The black scabbard fish looks like a deep water eel with black skin so dark and slimy and slick it could be soaked in ink. It has huge bulging eyes and a protruding lower jaw. Because of how deep the black scabbard fish lives, it's pretty rare for someone to find one let alone catch it at the end of your fishing line. But the fish is also a delicacy in Portugal, and there are some fishermen who use special deep water lines to catch it. Would you be adventurous enough to try it? Let me know in the comments below. And now for a spooky town. But first, want to give a big shout out to Tanya Evans and Chris Hadwin. Thanks so much for supporting this channel. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already and join the Origins Explained family. We'd love to have you. Secret Underwater Town Something unbelievable has been discovered underwater and it made conspiracy theorists go crazy. The discovery was made off the coast of Florida in the Gulf of Mexico, near a popular tourist destination called Snapper Ledge Reef. It's been described as a secret underwater town, and it's nothing short of creepy. Tables, chairs, antennas, and other mysterious artifacts populate the strange underwater venue. Nobody was immediately sure how it got there, or what its purpose was but it was apparently discovered using Google Earth. Some have speculated that the town could have been built by underwater humans, aka mermaids. After all, it's not like ordinary fish need antenna to get a Wi-Fi signal. If not mermaids or some breed of sea people, just who exactly is all the furniture in this submerged town there for? Unfortunately, the truth is far less shocking than the speculation. The underwater town was actually built as a coral nursery, to help ocean life regenerate after the devastating coral bleaching that has been going on off the coast of Florida. Coral bleaching is destroying huge patches of coral all the way from Florida to Australia, and this coral nursery is one way that marine biologists are trying to help the ocean to heal. The Thing with Eight Jaws An utterly terrifying new species of sea monster has just been discovered, and it's frightening enough to give you nightmares. The creature looks like something straight out of H.P. Lovecraft's darkest fantasy like a monster from another dimension. It was found thanks to researchers with the French Natural History Museum, about 1,600 feet beneath the surface of the ocean, 120 miles from New Caledonia. The creature was located on top of a sea mount, what's essentially an underwater mountain. It has an array of tentacles with hooks on the ends and dozens of razor-sharp teeth inside its mouth. 
It also has eight separate jaws to rip and tear its prey more easily. This is a one-of-a-kind species of brittle star, the most violent and terrifying ocean star you'll ever encounter. It's officially named Ophiojura, and it's reminiscent of the monsters that used to live during prehistoric eras. It's not exactly a starfish, as brittle stars are only distantly related to starfish. They hang out on the seafloor and live a life of constant eating. Each of its eight jaws has rows of sharp teeth which it uses to snare its prey. Think about a bear trap, but there are eight of them hooked together, ready to crush anything that accidentally gets too close. But where does such a strange animal come from? DNA evidence suggests that Ophiojura evolved about 180 million years ago, around the end of the Triassic and the beginning of the Jurassic, when dinosaurs still roamed the land. The nightmarish brittle star has remained the same, untouched by evolution, ever since. Number 3. The Whiskey Fish A fisherman got the surprise of his life when he caught a large fish. But it wasn't the fish itself that was that exciting. It was what was inside the fish. A video on TikTok is showing a fisherman pulling his catch onto his boat, where he drops it on a table and starts to cut it open. He was gutting the innards of the fish when he noticed something rather strange about its stomach. It was unusually hard, so the fisherman quickly cut out the organs to see what the fish was hiding. As it turned out, the fish had an entire bottle of unopened fireball whiskey inside its belly. Because it was revealed on TikTok, some have accused the fisherman of faking the entire thing by putting the bottle of whiskey there himself. But at the same time, it is possible that the bottle fell off someone's boat and the fish swallowed it, thinking it was food. After all, it wouldn't be the first time a fish was caught eating something it shouldn't have. Sea Lion Cancer Scientists at the Marine Mammal Center near San Francisco have come across a horrible and tragic phenomenon going on in the ocean. For the past 20 years, these scientists have been trying to understand why California sea lions have the highest rates of cancer of any marine mammal on the planet. To give you an idea of just how many sea lions are coming down with cancer, it's about 25% of the adult population. But get ready to be creeped out because between 2005 and 2015, that 25% of adult sea lions was discovered with a urogenital carcinoma directly linked to the herpes virus. But until just recently, scientists couldn't figure out why these sea lions were coming down with this disease. Recent evidence has shed light on the mystery. Scientists now know the sea lions have been exposed to toxic pollutants that began being dumped off the southern coast of California in the 1940s. By the time the barrels of toxic waste stopped being dumped into the ocean in the 1970s, it was too late. All these years later, the chemicals are still decimating the sea lion population. The area in which the barrels were dumped happens to be where 90% of sea lions are born. As of right now, scientists see no way to stop the trend and save the sea lions from cancer. The Singapore Shipwreck Off the coast of Singapore, archaeologists have found a creepy shipwreck over 200 years old. According to the National Heritage Board, the wreck was found off Pedra Branca, a rocky outcrop in the ocean east of Singapore. Divers accidentally came across ceramic plates, and this led them to the wreckage. It had probably been carrying Chinese ceramics for trade back in the 14th century, when Singapore was known as Temasek. This was a pretty significant find for archaeologists, as they were able to confirm Singapore's importance as a trading hub way before the British ever arrived to colonize it in 1819. But the discovery didn't end with one shipwreck. A second was found nearby and identified as a merchant vessel constructed in India that sank in 1796 while returning home from China. The second wreckage revealed even more fascinating artifacts such as anchors and cannons. These cannons were what helped the British Empire to expand in Asia during the 18th century and were usually mounted onto merchant ships used by the famed East India Trading Company. There is not much left of the actual ships other than some creepy wooden hulls left on the rocks, like the broken rib cages of sea monsters. Deep Sea Hatchetfish The Mariana Trench is the deepest underwater place there is, reaching 36,200 feet. It is dark and mysterious, home to all kinds of strange creatures and perhaps even monsters. The Deep Sea Hatchetfish is not only one of the strangest creatures found in the Mariana Trench, it is also one of the most bizarre animals anywhere on the planet. It has evolved to live in the darkest depths of the sea, and it has specialized organs that emit light to conceal the fish's shadow from potential predators. 
But perhaps the most striking and horrifying feature of the deep sea hatchetfish is its huge eyes, which look as though it's screaming in eternal agony. In fact, the fish looks like some kind of tortured soul that got flushed down the toilet. The hatchetfish lives in one of the most inhospitable environments on our planet. Deep in the Mariana Trench, it's a fish-eat-fish -fish world in the dark. Luckily, the hatchetfish is well adapted for survival. Because the trench is so black, the faintest silhouette or glint of light can give up a creature's location to a potential predator. The hatchetfish has found a way around this by growing into a slender shape, much like a hatchet blade. It has reflective scales and light-emitting organs to make itself virtually invisible. The hatchetfish can cast a glow from its underside which perfectly matches with the darkness around it, making it unseeable to the vicious predators lurking even deeper in the depths. This kind of self-defense mechanism is known as bioluminescent counter-illumination. It's one of the best forms of camouflage for ocean creatures. It even helps the hatchetfish when it swims into shallower waters in the brighter environment to feed, because from below, the hatchetfish is so thin it can barely be seen and its bioluminescence completely erases its shadow. The Frilled Shark Out of all the monsters living throughout the Mariana Trench, the frilled shark is perhaps the most shocking. It is a bizarre fish that looks like a prehistoric dinosaur. It lives throughout much of the open ocean, including in the deepest and darkest waters in various trenches across the globe, just like the Mariana Trench. The shark can reach up to 7 feet in length, and it gets its name because of its strange gills that look like frills around its face. The gills go all the way across its throat, and each is lined with red fringe, making them very pronounced, which really adds to its monster-like appearance. The frilled shark is an active predator that spends all its time swimming through the ocean like an eel, twisting its body in a serpentine fashion while it hunts for unsuspecting prey. It also has a terrifying mouth, lined with 25 rows of gnarly teeth that total to about 300 in all. They are in the shape of a trident facing backwards, so whatever it grasps has no way of escaping except down its throat. Biologist David A. Ebert, director of the Pacific Shark Research Center, says that even looking at a dead specimen's mouth can hurt. I can tell you from snagging my fingers on the teeth, you can only back out one way, and that's in toward the mouth and then out, he told Wired. It didn't feel good, I can tell you that. Besides all of its teeth, it also has hard spines lining its mouth, which help it to crush squid and fish and it's even been caught munching on other kinds of shark. Not a whole lot else is known about the ecology of the frilled shark. Encounters in the wild are exceptionally rare. They live so deep and in so many remote corners of the ocean and the Mariana Trench that the only time they're usually seen is when one gets accidentally caught in a fisherman's net. The first time one was spotted in its natural habitat was 2004. Deep Sea Amphipod A newly discovered creature has taken the scientific world by storm. It's not a very big creature, only about 2 inches in length, but it is absolutely fascinating. It looks kind of like a shrimp, and was captured at a depth of 20,000 feet inside the Mariana Trench. This is deeper than most animals in the trench live, though still far from its ultimate depth of 36,000 feet. What is this strange animal? It's a type of amphipod, which scientists have called Eurythenes plasticus. You may have picked up the last part of its name, plasticus. It sounds a lot like plastic, right? This is because the creature was named after polythylene terephthalate, which you might recognize as PET. This is a common type of plastic resin used in the fibers for many different types of clothing, bottles, and packages for food. But why would they name a newly discovered creature after plastic? The answer is because PET, or PET, was found inside of this animal's guts. Even 20,000 feet deep in the Mariana Trench, inside of an animal only 2 inches long and only just discovered by scientists, plastic has pervaded. How is this possible? According to Forbes, over 100 million tons of this resin is produced every year, and a lot of it ends up in rivers, where it gets transported out to the sea and the perpetual motion of the ocean breaks down the plastic into microplastics, which get distributed all over the world. They have been found even at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, where they end up in this new little amphipod stummy. Mud Monsters A recent underwater expedition to the deepest part of the ocean filmed the first ever footage of a horde of bizarre sea creatures feeding at a depth of around 15,800 feet. Also called little mud monsters, some of these were pretty ordinary shrimp, which just so happened to live at record-breaking depths. But shrimp weren't the only monsters the research team filmed. They also witnessed sponges, lizardfish that were pure white like ghosts, 
and an unidentified breed of hermit crab. This was a rare glimpse into the deep sea world that is the Mariana Trench. The shrimp and its other mud monster friends were spotted thanks to a vessel called the Deep Discoverer, a type of remotely operated vehicle deployed during an expedition led by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. They descended down to what may have been a type of mud volcano, where the seafloor is coated with thick sediment. The curious shrimp were just about five inches long and were witnessed standing on their back feet with their six front legs spread open to catch tiny creatures and particles flowing in the current like an undersea net. Its legs have tiny hairs on them that likely catch incoming particles of food for the shrimp to gobble up. Life down here is a whole other world. The Telescope Octopus one of the most elusive and least talked about octopus in the world lives between 500 and 6,500 feet deep in the ocean and has been known to hang out in the Mariana Trench. It's called the Telescope Octopus, a small creature only 8 inches long with its arms accounting for at least half of its length. Scientists believe the Telescope Octopus is related to the Glass Octopus, another species of deep-sea cephalopod. But the Telescope Octopus is unique even among its peers. The reason the telescope octopus got its name is because of its elongated tubular eyes that look like telescope eyes. Each eye is on an elongated stalk that can move around, giving the octopus a rotating telescopic view of its world. This is incredibly rare in any species, making the telescope octopus a one-of-a-kind deep-sea monster. Unlike most octopuses that hover above the sea floor and scoop up whatever food they can find, the telescope octopus drifts along with deep ocean currents. It spends a large majority of its time suspended in water columns instead of crawling around on the floor. This gives the octopus a perpetual state of motion which protects it from predators. And because it lives so deep and often cruises through the Mariana Trench, there aren't that many predators to ward off anyway. The Mariana Trench Monster Speaking of monsters, there could be a true beast lurking somewhere in the depths of the Mariana Trench. There was a noise recorded by autonomous seafaring robots designed to eavesdrop on whales. Scientists recorded a noise from another world that they have dubbed the Western Pacific Bio-Twang. The call includes sounds that range from between 38 hertz and 8,000 hertz, which is an extremely wide range and very distinct. Researcher Sharon Newkirk from Oregon State University says that the low frequency is typical of baleen whales, but that this one is quite different. Perhaps it is a mink whale. The twangy call lasts up to three and a half seconds and was recorded in the fall and the spring of 2014 and 2015. The research team admits that we don't know much about mink whale distributions. We don't know much about them at all. They spend very little time at the surface and have an inconspicuous blow, making them very hard to spot. While scientists couldn't pinpoint the precise origin of the sound, they did say it came from the Pacific Ocean in the area around the Mariana Trench, suggesting some kind of great creature made the noise from deep down inside, and it traveled all the way to where it was picked up by the robots. While nobody has any clue what kind of animal could produce such an incredible vocal explosion other than a whale, some say it could have been an unidentified creature of biblical proportions hiding at the bottom of the trench, maybe even the great Cthulhu waking from its slumber. After all, there are giant squids and strange sharks living down there as well. Why not a monster we have yet to identify? Ghost Fish On a recent research mission to the trench, biologists discovered a very rare ghost fish. The creature has been described as having gelatinous skin and being transparent, and it's the first of its kind to ever be seen alive. According to Bruce Mundy, a fishery biologist involved in the discovery, he was absolutely stunned by the ethereal fish, which almost looks like a small fishy angel floating through the water. The ghost fish was only seen on video and wasn't actually captured. This means biologists haven't been able to properly identify the creature as a new species. It certainly looked like something new, but there is not much scientists can do without actually getting a physical specimen. The big question is, why has the ghost fish evolved to be translucent white? Scientists say it could be the lack of light at the bottom of the ocean. Without really being able to see one another, it doesn't matter much what color a fish is. Also, because food is so scarce, animals don't typically put a lot of their energy into developing pigment patterns. The Mariana Snailfish The deepest fish ever discovered in the ocean has been collected from the Mariana Trench. The fish looks kind of like a tadpole, only translucent with its organs clearly showing through its skin. The species is known as the Mariana Snailfish, 
and it was discovered thanks to researchers at the University of Washington. To date, it's the deepest fish ever taken from the ocean. How deep, you ask? During research missions in 2014, 36 specimens were collected from depths between 22,600 and 26,000 feet. Researchers collected the snailfish by using special bags baited with mackerel. The snailfish swam into the bag to get the mackerel and the researchers pulled them all the way back up to the surface. The deepest sighting was actually made at 26,716 feet by a Japanese expedition in January, though that fish was never caught. From what these scientists have gathered by analyzing the specimens, snailfish have adapted to live deeper than any other fish. They thrive near the bottom of the Mariana Trench, living on a diet of small crustaceans and shrimp, which they hoover into their mouths like a vacuum. The Fan Fin Sea Devil Nothing in the dismal depths of the Mariana Trench is quite as ghoulish, terrifying, or straight-up freakish as the Fan Fin Sea Devil. It's a type of anglerfish with a bioluminescent lure that it dangles in front of its teeth that are like broken shards of glass in a shattered window pane. This is one of the most disturbing and scary fish anywhere in the world. It uses its lure to mimic living bait, which convinces unsuspecting fish to swim directly into its open mouth. At that point, the fish is basically toast. Not only are the sea devil's fangs great for ripping and tearing, they can also be used like the bars of a jail cell. Sometimes, the fanfin sea devil doesn't even bother to chew. It just traps its victim inside its mouth and then swallows it, forcing the fish down into its belly. What's even more bizarre is that the anglerfish can bloat its stomach to accommodate victims much larger than itself. In all of the world's oceans, there are 168 species of deep-sea anglerfish. The fanfin sea devil just so happens to be one of the ugliest, and one of the only species that lives in the deepest trench on Earth, the Megalodon. Anyone ready for Shark Week? The Megalodon was one of the scariest animals that ever lived in the ocean. Despite being extinct, there have been numerous reports over the centuries of abnormally giant sharks terrorizing the deep. In 1918, fishermen claimed that their nets were stolen by a giant shark. In 1933, there were reports of a giant sea beast off the coast of French Polynesia. In 2018, unexplained videos were posted online with one of them allegedly showing a giant shark that could have been a megalodon prowling the Mariana Trench. In 2021, a large shark was reported circling a cruise ship that some claimed was the Megalodon. This shark was reportedly 17 feet long, not even close to how big the Megalodon could get. But these sightings have made people question, could the Megalodon really still be alive? And could it be residing in secret, deep in the Mariana Trench? The Megalodon went extinct about 2.6 million years ago. Before being wiped off the face of the Earth, they grew to be around 60 feet long with a weight of at least 100 tons. They lived in every major world ocean and feasted on great white sharks for breakfast, and probably even each other. If the Megalodon still existed now, there would most likely be a lot of proof. Sharks love to eat fish, and larger sharks love bigger, blubberous mammals like seals, sea lions, and whales. There aren't any of those living that deep under the sea, so the shark would have to come closer to the surface to eat and they would need to eat a lot to maintain their enormous size. If they had somehow managed to survive, we would also see enormous bite marks left over in other animals, and we would continue to find their enormous teeth. There are already giant sharks today prowling through the waters. I don't think we need even bigger ones. The Thames Treasure Trove Have you ever been mudlarking? In case you don't know, this is when you go looking for artifacts and goodies in the mud. Treasure hunters and mudlarkers will often go poking through the mud along the Thames River in London during low tide. This river has seen a lot of history and is a favorite place to throw your unwanted items, so it makes sense that mudlarkers like Steve Brooker and Lara Maklem can be found there looking for valuable artifacts. Nicknamed the Mud God, Brooker has spent time sifting through the river's eroding banks several times weekly for over 25 years. He's found coins, buttons, Roman shoes, medieval pins, 18th century witch bottles, voodoo dolls dating back to the 20th century, live bombs, and more. Brooker even once recovered actress Helen Mirren's missing ring after she accidentally threw it into the water with some grass clippings from her yard. One day in 2019, a Spital Fields Life blogger known only as The Gentle Author accompanied this seasoned treasure seeker during one of his routine hunts. They uncovered an array of artifacts, including a Tudor brick, decimal coins, 
bullets, marbles, a spur, an 18th century fork, clay pipes, and this peculiar 200-year-old statue of a woman found face down in the riverbed. Lara Maklem has also been fascinated by history and loves to go mudlarking along the shore of the river looking for little bits of history. She has found everything from a human jaw to Venetian glass to Tudor money boxes and pewter medieval pilgrim badges. Mudlarkers have been exploring the Thames since at least as far back as the late 18th century, when the river served as the world's biggest port. At the time, they were simply scavengers who looked around for valuable objects that were dropped or left behind by criminals who looted ships. While mudlarking is now considered a respectable hobby, many of the discoveries that are made date back hundreds of years, proving that the original collectors missed more than a few items while they scoured the riverbed for anything they could try to sell. Now mudlarkers are amateur archaeologists, professional historians, and regular people who love to find things. If you are interested in learning more, Maclem wrote a book called Mudlark in Search of London's Past Along the River Thames, which is an award-winning Sunday Times bestseller. Have you ever done this before? Let me know in the comments below. Holy Bear Skull Located in Russia's mysterious southern Ural Mountains, Imane Cave is filled with the bones of over 100 small cave bears and other Pleistocene-era animals who died around 35,000 years ago. Most show no signs of violence and appear to have died while hibernating through the harsh Siberian winter. But a team of scientists noticed a small, narrow hole through the back of one skull that looks like it may have been inflicted by a spear or some other weapon. If their suspicions are correct, it would be the oldest known example of prehistoric humans hunting cave bears or perhaps engaging in some sort of post-mortem ritual. The bear died out during the last ice age, shortly after humans first migrated into northeastern Russia, and the animal's skull was discovered near evidence of human occupancy within the cave. While it's well known among experts that ancient people hunted mammoths and other huge mammals, this would be the first indication that they hunted small cave bears. Study co-author Dmitry Gimranov conceded that the hole could be natural or artificial, but he said it's likely that humans either killed the bear or mutilated the skull as part of a ritual. The rest of the skeleton lacks any signs of people removing meat from the bones, so it doesn't look like they ate them. There is much evidence that sacred practices were common in the region at the time. Either way, a recently published study detailing the discovery leans strongly toward the belief that one way or another, ancient humans were piercing the cranium of prehistoric bears. Mysterious Extinct Humans Researchers at the Nasher Ramla archaeological site in central Israel recently discovered an array of ancient artifacts, including stone tools, horse, deer, and wild ox bones, and the remains of what they believe might be a previously unknown species of extinct humans. Dating back between 140,000 and 120,000 years, the remains contain a distinct mixture of Neanderthal and early human characteristics that differ from the features of Homo sapiens who lived in the area at the time. The discovery adds to a growing collection of evidence that Neanderthals did not originate in Europe as scientists long suspected, but that they evolved from a mysterious group of ancient hominids from somewhere else. Dubbed the Nesher Ramla Homo, the group may represent this obscure population. As Dr. Yossi Zeidner from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem pointed out, experts are quickly learning that the history of human migration is much more complicated than we originally assumed. In piecing together the confusing hominid family tree, it's becoming increasingly apparent that our ancestors and their relatives did not leave Africa in a single cut-and-dry episode of migration. Researchers are now revisiting past discoveries of ancient human bones found at other sites in Israel to determine whether they, too, might be part of this suspected lost lineage. Laptop Lady Statue In early 2016, an anonymous YouTuber who goes by the name Still Speaking Out released a video alleging that an ancient Greek funerary statue dating back to around 100 BC depicts a woman holding a laptop with USB ports on the side. Everyone freaked out. Conspiracy theorists and armchair experts typed furiously, claiming that it was proof that people in ancient times must have had technology. Still Speaking Out said that he perceived the artwork as a prediction, citing the sacred Oracle of Delphi site where priests went to connect with the gods and retrieve advanced information. The statue is located at the J. Paul Getty Museum in Malibu, California. Jeffrey Spire, a curator who works at the museum, admitted that the object in the statue does resemble a laptop. Speaking to Live Science, he offered the far more reasonable explanation that it's a jewelry box, a hinged mirror, 
or a box containing incense. University of Oregon art history professor Jeff Hurwitz said that these so-called USB ports are actually drill holes for attaching a bronze or marble object. There was something probably attached, but it was not a USB. Officially titled Grave Nyskos of an Enthroned Woman with an Attendant, the statue shows a wealthy woman sitting on an armchair and touching the lid of a shallow box in the hands of a servant girl, according to the J. Paul Getty Museum's website. Known as a Nyskos, nice it's one of many funerary reliefs that were crafted between the 6th century BC and the 1st century BC, and were used for marking graves. If you ask the experts, this is just another case of someone creating a mystery where one doesn't exist. But at least it brings attention to artifacts. Extinct Goose Earlier this year, researchers announced that a trio of geese depicted in the artwork of the 4,600-year-old tomb of ancient Egyptian ruler Nefermat I and his wife Itet represent an extinct species, offering a rare glimpse at an animal that unfortunately no longer exists. The painting, a famous piece of artwork known as Maidum Geese and nicknamed the Mona Lisa of Egypt, is also unique because it features a real creature, unlike many ancient Egyptian depictions of mythical deities and animals. Currently housed at Cairo's Museum of Egyptian Antiquities, the fresco was discovered in 1871 at a site in Lower Egypt called Maidum, hence the name. Experts were puzzled about the birds for quite some time, until evolutionary biologist Dr. Anthony Romilio recently examined the animals and spotted what he believes is a speckled goose that is no longer seen in the modern world. Romilio said that it's possible that artistic license could explain the differences between the geese in the fresco and modern geese, but because the other birds depicted in the artwork are extremely realistic, the images are probably accurate representations of a species we are not familiar with today. The birds were previously thought to be a red-breasted goose species, which are found in Europe, not Northern Africa, where no such remains have ever been found, and do not exactly match the geese in the painting. This is the only known documentation of the suspected extinct species, which in Romilio's words, appears now to be globally extinct. Unfortunately, it's unlikely that researchers will ever know what caused the animal to fade from existence. Roman Ruins Under Theater during the second century, a fire tore through a Roman building in what is now Verona in northern Italy, causing the roof to collapse and leaving charred furniture in its wake. The destroyed structure was forgotten about until recently, when archaeologists discovered it beneath an abandoned cinema that has sat vacant for the better part of two decades. To everyone's delight, the building's interior, including its magnificent frescoed walls, are remarkably intact, earning it the nickname Miniature Pompeii. It's unusual to uncover a site that is in nearly as good condition as it was thousands of years ago, but that appears to be the case here. Researchers believe that the building was too big to function as a private residence, leaving them puzzled about what it was used for. It's located just blocks away from the Verona Arena, a Roman amphitheater that was built during the first century and is still in use today. Founded in the second century BC, Verona became a Roman colony during the first century AD and is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It is known as one of the most romantic cities in the world, home to Romeo and Juliet, and you can still visit the famous balcony today. The discovery of the building comes on the heels of the discovery of a shockingly well-preserved mosaic just north of Verona last year. Oversized Early Hieroglyphics While working near the ancient Egyptian city of El Cab in 2017, a team of archaeologists led by Yale University Egyptologist John Darnell noticed some unusually large carvings on a cliff face at a site called El Kawi. Included among the depictions are a bull's head on a pole, two storks, and a type of bird called an ibis. A closer analysis revealed that the oversized etchings date back roughly 5,500 years to sometime around 3,250 BC and constitute the oldest known example of hieroglyphics during their early, formative stage. The images date back to a period known as Dynasty Zero, when ancient scribes were just beginning to master the hieroglyphic writing system. Unlike other Dynasty Zero carvings, which are typically less than an inch tall, the inscriptions at El Kawi are 27 inches high. They predate other large hieroglyphics by roughly 300 years. The images resemble characters that were eventually used to convey a pharaoh's power. Darnell believes that the carvings acted as a boundary marker of sorts, which identified a particular king's jurisdiction over the area. It was, in his words, a way for travelers to know that they were entering an area under official authority. 
He also sees the early hieroglyphics as evidence that the writing system was established much more quickly than experts previously believed, and that its use for publicly declaring royal rule began early on in its development. A Hidden Portrait of a Hated Woman While living in Scotland in 1589, Dutch-born painter Adrian Vanson concealed a highly controversial portrait and took this secret to his grave. By all appearances, the artwork bears the image of a Tudor aristocrat named Sir John Maitland. Fast forward roughly 450 years to 2017, when experts x-rayed the painting as part of a research project and discovered that Maitland was not the intended subject. Beneath his image are the traces of what was originally meant to be a portrait of Mary, Queen of Scots, a widely despised royal who was eventually beheaded for her participation in a plot to kill Queen Elizabeth I, and who was suspected of murdering her husband. This is one of few contemporary images of the detested monarch that are known to exist, even though it's invisible to the naked eye. The cover-up portrait of Maitland is dated to two years after Mary's execution in 1587, a time when it was especially risky to create an image of the queen. It's likely that Vanson realized this after he started the painting, and once he came to his senses, he hastily covered it with Maitland's portrait. It was probably a good decision. America's Oldest Outhouse You know what they say, one person's trash is another person's treasure. Over 14,000 years ago in what is now Paisley, Oregon, an ancient group of people used a cave as their bathroom. Not only did they leave their waste behind, they also left a number of other artifacts, including stone tools. A few years ago, archaeologists discovered a collection of fossilized fecal matter known as coprolites at the lowest excavation level at the site, now known as Paisley Cave. This might sound gross, but finding ancient organic matter is extremely exciting to a lot of people. Their age adds to a growing pile of evidence indicating that people arrived in the Americas before the so-called Clovis people, who came here around 13,000 years ago and were long believed to be North America's first human inhabitants. Some experts have challenged the findings, claiming that the prehistoric poop was deposited by animals and contaminated with human DNA. Study co-author and chemist Ian Bull admitted that this is possible but unlikely. Working with feces sounds wildly unpleasant to most people, but experts were thrilled at the opportunity to learn more about the everyday lives and diets of the people who answered nature's call inside Paisley Cave. The specimens contain traces of mammoth and other large game, as well as seed coatings, rodent bones, organic plant compounds, and outer shells from insects. Unlike coprolites found at sites where waste was deliberately managed, the feces from the cave reflects a nomadic population and could prove useful to better understanding the movement and day-to-day -day habits of ancient people throughout the continent. Human Bone Instruments Humans have memorialized the dead for thousands of years, and we've come up with infinite ways of doing it along the way. During the Bronze Age in what is now Britain, people were buried with bone fragments from other deceased family members, and they even kept the bones of lost loved ones on display in their homes, according to University of Bristol archaeologist Joanna Bruick. There are numerous theories about why people engaged in these practices. Researcher Tom Booth proposed that the bones were seen as relics and were associated with religious or mythical figures from hundreds or thousands of years ago. On the other hand, a study published last year found that people crafted keepsakes out of their dead relatives' bones within decades of a person passing rather than centuries. Bones were made into amulets, ornaments, and other decorative objects that most modern humans wouldn't dream of showcasing in their home. In one grave, archaeologists found a whistle carved from a thigh bone. Speaking with The Guardian, Thomas Booth, who radiocarbon dated the remains used in the study, said that these practices, which are macabre by modern standards, reflect a more blurred line between the living and the dead than we have in today's society. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Castel del Monte Castel del Monte, or Castle of the Mountain, is a 13th century castle and citadel located in southeastern Italy's Apulia region. Situated on a hill in the city of Andria, it was built during the 1240s by Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II. The most unique mystery about this castle is its emphasis on the number 8 and the geometric octagon. It's famous for its octagonal geometric design with an octagonal tower at each corner rumored to be built based on measurements with hidden meanings that are said to hold secrets or codes. Mm. It is not in a strategic position and it lacks both a moat and a drawbridge, which was characteristic of the time. 
It was never intended as a defensive fortress in the first place. So why did the Holy Roman Emperor decide to build this? Inside, it contains two floors with eight rooms each and an eight-sided courtyard. Scholars have found astronomical symbols, and there are many details that probably were meant to hide something deeper. Hundreds of years ago, the castle was surrounded by a dense forest, which would have kept it hidden from outsiders. There are many stories of ghosts said to roam the castle. Men who were killed here, or servants or prisoners who died, unable to make the transition and get out of its walls. Legend goes that spirits have been wandering here for centuries. Others say it is the soul of Frederick II, who does not want to leave his beloved castle. Officially, this place was said to be Frederick's hunting lodge, but unofficially there are rumors that the castle was built for a much more spiritual purpose. The castle was built on top of a Benedictine monastery that was there long before, which may have influenced its shape. The octagonal plan is the geometric shape closest to the circle, which is the representation of the union of the earth with the divine. So perhaps the shape and function of the castle was more for God than for hunting. Perhaps Frederick II met in secret here with the Knights Templar, but since he died soon after the castle was built, we will never know what his plans were. Since that time, the castle has been through a lot. It was used as a state prison in the late 13th century, then became a refuge during a plague before falling into disrepair. During the 19th century, its interior marbles and furnishings were looted and repurposed for other building projects. The U.S. military used the castle as a secret navigational aid station amid the Allied occupation of Italy during World War II. This castle has seen a lot. In honor of the castle, it is on Italy's version of the one-cent euro coin, and it's also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Carvings of the Underworld Excavations at the Yashkaya Rock Temple, a Hittite shrine in modern-day Turkey, have been ongoing for nearly two centuries. But it was only recently that archaeologists made a breakthrough interpretation of an ancient calendar and map of the cosmos carved into the stone. It looks like the Hittites believed in an underworld that exists beneath the Earth's surface. Carved into the limestone around 3,200 years ago, the artwork consists of over 90 depictions of animals, gods, and monsters. The images were first discovered in 1834 by French archaeologist and historian Charles Tessier. Now, 200 years later, researchers finally think they know what the etchings mean. They believe the carvings represent a creation myth consisting of the Earth, the sky, and an underworld. Drawings of the sun and storm goddesses were placed higher than the pictures of so-called lesser people and representations of the seasons and the phases of the moon. Another room contains a depiction of an underworld and imagery dedicated to the god of the sword. In addition to representing what one researcher described as a symbolic image of the universe, the pictures reflect cycles and rebirth, including changes in seasons as well as day and night. Created between 1700 and 1100 BC, the Yashkaya Shrine embodies the Hittite society's beliefs about how the universe is structured and their spiritual views, including images of some of the 17 gods and goddesses that they worshipped. New Human Species Nearly 90 years ago, in 1933, workers in the northern Chinese city of Harbin discovered a giant fossilized skull. The men who found it recognized its importance and decided to not say anything. Because the country was occupied by Japan at the time, one of the workers wrapped the skull and hid it in an abandoned well to keep it out of Japanese hands. Shortly before his death in 2018, the man told his grandson where the artifact was hidden. Chinese researchers recently determined that the skull is at least 146,000 years old and that it belonged to a member of a previously unknown ancient hominid species, informally dubbed the Dragon Man, and scientifically named Homo longi. Measuring 9 inches long and over 6 inches wide, it is much larger than a modern human skull. It belonged to a man who was around 50 years old when he died and who was equipped with a wide nose that enabled him to breathe with ease during heavy activity, according to a series of newly published studies describing the species. Researchers speculate that the man had a sturdy build that enabled him to survive the region's harsh winters at the time. The study's authors point out that the skull differs from all other known Homo species with its mix of ancient and modern features. For example, it has large square eye sockets but is delicate despite its massive size and is also long and low compared to the more rounded skulls of people today. 
Using advanced computer software, the team determined that the cranium and a few others that have been found throughout China form a new branch of the human family tree that was closer to modern humans than Neanderthals. Not all scientists are convinced that the Harbin skull represents a new species. Professor Chris Stringer of the Natural History Museum in London said that it resembles another skull found in 1978, which belongs to a species known as Homo daliensis. To all of us, potato, potato, because in the end, even he said that it was one of the most important finds of the past 50 years. Reopened Graves All across Europe, archaeologists have noticed that around 1400 years ago, there was a tendency for people to reopen graves and take things out of them. Experts have long been trying to understand the reasons for this, and a new study suggests that it wasn't a spate of grave robberies like it may seem at first glance. An examination of previously excavated cemeteries from five regions throughout Europe confirmed that this trend went on between the 6th and 8th centuries. People were selective about which items they took and favored brooches and swords, while often leaving behind other valuables, including objects made from precious metals like silver and gold. Strangely, people also often took items that were in poor condition and had no monetary value or practical use. The team wrote that graves were typically reopened within a generation of being buried, after the deceased individual's soft tissue had decayed, but before their wooden coffin collapsed. The researchers speculated that people's reasons probably varied, but the items that they took likely had symbolic value, perhaps as heirlooms to be passed down from one generation to the next. This tradition peaked during the 7th century, but largely died out before the 8th century. Although the study offers fresh insight and a solid starting point for further exploring the custom, the exact reasons behind it remain a mystery. A Lost Village French and Spanish historical records dating back to the 1560s mention a Native American village called Cerebe in what is now northeastern Florida, but its location has long evaded archaeologists, that is, until now. Researchers from the University of Northern Florida have just announced the discovery of what they believe is the long-lost settlement at the southern end of Big Talbot Island. Expanding upon previous excavations that were carried out during the late 90s, the team found over 50 pieces of early Spanish pottery and indigenous pottery dating back to the late 16th or early 17th century, as well as burned corncob fragments and bone, stone, and shell artifacts. The site was occupied by a Mokama-speaking Timucua tribe who lived along northern Florida's Atlantic coast and were among the first Native Americans to encounter Spanish colonizers when they arrived in 1562. Further investigation is needed to confirm that the settlement is, in fact, Cerebi, and the team hopes to find houses and public architecture as they continue to explore the site over the next three years as part of the UNF Archaeology Lab's ongoing Mokama archaeological project. 9,000-year-old tools Around 9,000 years ago, a group of ancient people left behind a collection of stone tool artifacts in Lake Huron. A new study found that the items were made from obsidian that was sourced from a quarry over 2,000 miles away in what is now central Oregon, making them the oldest examples of western obsidian ever found in the United States. Ashley Lemke, an assistant professor of sociology and anthropology at the University of Texas at Arlington, told SciTech Daily that the artifacts reveal the far-reaching social connections that existed across North America long ago, stating in her own words, these are very small pieces that have very large stories to tell. Divers retrieved the objects from an undisturbed underwater site as part of a broader investigation into what life was like for a group of caribou hunters toward the end of the last ice age. They were deposited on dry ground when water levels were much lower and became submerged as glaciers melted. Lemke pointed out that the study emphasizes the importance of underwater archaeology and how these sites tend to be well-preserved compared to those on land, giving researchers unprecedented opportunities to examine the past. Decapitated Bodies In May of this year, archaeologists announced the discovery of 17 decapitated bodies at three Roman cemeteries in Cambridgeshire, England, a number they describe as exceptionally high. Dating back roughly 1,700 years, the headless remains were found among 52 graves at a site called Nobbs Farm. The victims consisted of nine men and eight women who were all older than 25 when they were killed. A recently published paper describes how some of them were kneeling when they died, and in many cases, the person's severed head was placed between their feet, and pottery was placed where their head would usually be. Some of the deceased were buried on their stomachs. 
The team that excavated the site believes that the beheaded individuals were executed for violating Roman law. During the 3rd and 4th centuries, when they were buried, there was a noticeable increase in capital crimes, and punishments against violators became harsher. Evidence suggests that the site was used as a supply center, and that violators may have met with swift, life-ending consequences. In the article, the researchers wrote that the number of crimes that carried the death penalty increased from 14 to 60, between the beginning of the 3rd century and Constantine's death in 337 AD, due to heightened security concerns. The time period saw several civil wars throughout the Roman Empire as people competed to become emperor, and so-called barbarian attacks were also on the rise. Despite being put to death, some of the individuals were still given a somewhat dignified burial complete with valuable grave goods, and their families were allowed to request the return of their body, according to lead archaeologist Isabel Lisboa. She added that these people were probably not slaves, because slaves were not afforded any official status and were not given proper burials or grave goods. Not all experts agree with the findings. Simon Cleary, professor emeritus of Roman archaeology at the University of Birmingham, told Life Science that if decapitations increased along with stricter laws, they would be found throughout the Roman Empire. But these burials are almost entirely exclusive to Britain, suggesting that they were carried out as a deterrent mechanism for anyone who might be thinking about breaking the law in a distant place where the law was difficult to enforce from the empire's headquarters. Scotland's Oldest Animal Carvings Between 4,000 and 5,000 years ago during the Bronze Age, someone carved images of two red deer and three smaller four-footed animals on the underside of a capstone covering a burial chamber in what is now Kilmartin Glen, Scotland. First discovered in the 1860s, the burial chamber contained the cremated remains of around 10 people, as well as a sharpening stone, axe, flint knife, and other artifacts, according to Historic Environment Scotland. But the etchings went unnoticed until recently, when archaeologist and aerial photographer Hamish Fenton spotted them during a visit to the site. This site is also the only known archaeological site in Scotland that contains animal etchings and cup and ring markings, which mm. consist of a central circle surrounded by concentric rings. There are over 3,000 prehistoric carved rocks in Scotland, with most of them being the cup and ring markings created by striking the rock surface with a stone tool. The presence of both types of carvings presents questions about their relationship to one another and what meaning they held. Prehistoric deer carvings are rare throughout the UK. Most carvings are geometric and not really figures, but the recently discovered carvings are uncharacteristically detailed, leaving no questions about which species the deer represent. This discovery has completely changed the way historians look at rock art in the UK, and gives us a small glimpse into the mind of the artist. Ancient Island Settlement Advancements in technology are making it easier than ever for archaeologists to explore sites and artifacts without excavating. One recent example is the discovery of a 6,000-year-old Neolithic settlement along the Croatian coastline by archaeologist Mate Parika, who first noticed the site while examining satellite imagery. He saw it and thought, maybe it's natural, maybe it's not. Located off the eastern shore of the island of Korkula, the settlement merely looked like a large, shallow area on the seabed at first glance. With the help of a colleague, Parika went diving at the site where he found what he believes to be an ancient village, dating back to around 4500 BC. When it was built, it sat on a narrow strip of land that once connected Korkula with the mainland. The submerged settlement contains the ruins of the stone walls that once surrounded it, as well as stone tools and other everyday items, including ceramic objects and flint knives. Speaking to Reuters, the local museum curator said that the village's location on a small islet is very unusual. Plus, most Neolithic finds have been made in caves, since this is where they usually lived, and the conditions in caves has helped to preserve everything. It's certainly possible that similar sites exist but haven't been discovered yet since finding lost cities underwater is not easy, especially if they are thousands of years old. Here, thankfully, the islands in the area acted as a barrier between the settlement and the heavy waves of the Mediterranean Sea, protecting it from destruction. Thanks for watching! Which discovery was your favorite? Let me know in the comments below and be sure to subscribe for more archaeological discoveries. See you next time! Bye!